Okay, so I think um, we'll get started. Uh, thank you so much to um, everyone for joining us um, either this morning or this afternoon. Um, really appreciate you taking the time uh, for this conversation. Uh, so just to introduce myself, my name is Claire Rhodes and I'm the CEO of Producers Direct. Um, and on behalf of all of the partners for today's webinar, Mercy Core Agri Finn, Cafe Direct, We Farm, IDEO, Dot org and producers direct a uh, very warm welcome on behalf of us all so we're here today to focus on farmer-led responses to COVID-19 particularly to share uh, critical information on the challenges that farmers are facing with respect to COVID-19 perspectives on what we're seeing um, in terms of the key priorities for smallholders but also partners uh, working with smallholders to support action across the supply chain and thirdly, uh, really looking to share across this group of participants um, ideas and recommendations for joint action. I'm really delighted that we've got a really strong panel to enrich our discussion today, each of whom bring long-standing experience working with smallholder farmers, bringing perspectives across both commercial and not-for-profit sectors. But equally importantly, um, our aim for today is to have a dynamic conversation between us all. So please be ready to share your ideas and perspectives on these key issues. So just um, before we start, just to get a sense of who's in the room um, and who is joining us this afternoon. So um, we're going to ask you all to um, go uh, and do a introductory poll. So hopefully um, in front of you, you should be able to see a poll. Um, so um, if you could, um, Choose your vote wisely and um, let us know uh, which organization or category um, you feel best represents you. That would be, that would be fantastic. Um, I'll just give you a few minutes just to uh, do that and look through the options. Uh, just while uh, we're finishing the poll, um, also just wanted to um, uh, focus on a couple of housekeeping points uh, before we start the agenda. Um, so as I was mentioning at the start, um, if you haven't already, it would be great if you could rename, rename your Zoom title to include your name and your organisation. As always with Zoom etiquette, uh, please keep your mic muted, unless of course you're speaking. Um, and also we just wanted to let you know that we will be recording uh, this webinar. Uh, for Spanish speakers um, on the line, uh, we do have summary interpretation not full uh, simultaneous translation, but um, if that's of interest, then you can hit the translation button at the bottom of the screen. If you're not a Spanish speaker, please don't hit that. That, um, that wouldn't go well. So <laughs> only go for that button if you um, want to listen to the Spanish feed. Uh, we've also activated the question and answer function, uh, which you'll also see at the bottom of your screen, uh, which we'll be using during the panelists' presentations. So any questions you have for the panelists or um, on the video, uh, please go ahead and send those through the question and answer function. Uh, we won't be able to answer them all live, uh, but we will be um, curating them and sharing a selection with the panelists at the end of their presentations. Um, and then um, if there are any other uh, burning questions that are unanswered, uh, we will look to uh, follow up on, on any key issues that we haven't addressed. Uh, on the tech side, just to let you know that from the Producers Direct and Cafe Direct uh, team, we have Sam and Roxy uh, behind the scenes helping um, make all of this happen smoothly. So if you do get a message for them, from them, um, that's, that's who they are. Um, so then just to um, go back to the poll and see how we're doing on that. Um, yeah, I mean, it looks like we've got a, um, a great mix across the different categories. Uh, a lot of people from uh, NGOs, uh, definitely people um, identifying kind of from the sustainability sector. Uh, the other thing um, I just wanted to highlight is that uh, beyond the Zoom participation, uh, we also um, are hopefully connecting with a number of our producer partner representatives across East Africa and Latin America. As you know, not everyone has access to Zoom, so we're multitasking a bit on the devices. Um, so hopefully uh, we do have um, a number of different voices on the line that won't be represented through this Zoom call. So um, hopefully connections pending, um, you'll be hearing from them later. So um, then I think um, as, we, as we kind of close the, 
poll. I think um, it's fantastic to see um, such a broad group of people. Thank you so much. Um, and with no further to do, um, what we're going to do now is to kickstart our session um, with a video that hopefully uh, gives you a flavour of the types of challenges that our producers are facing. Uh, you'll see from the video, it's all farmer-led content. Um, so um, it's, it's been filmed by farmers themselves and we, we hope uh, gives you an accurate representation of, of the realities in the different parts of the world where uh, we're working as consortium partners. Extraordinary emergence. situación es, es, es diferente este año, ¿no? Es un reto más que tenemos todos como organización, como, como personas en realidad. Uh, with COVID-19, we are in a situation where this disease has affected farming uh, negatively and we, we are here to, to, do, to have some mitigation measures where farmers should be protected from all this disease. Because this disease is real, we are sure that when we, this information is passed to the farmers, the farmers will be safe and will be working on their farms. La cooperativa describió los protocolos necesarios para evitar el contagio a sus socios y entre colaboradores. Primero, nosotros hicimos los lavaderos para Sorry, I think we've got a bit of a technical hitch with the video there. So we'll um, finish the video after the um, kind of the first panel presentation. Um, always with these things, it's a little technically challenging to get everything working all right. So please bear with us. Uh, so uh, moving on um, from the video, um, I'm very uh, pleased to introduce our panel, um, who will obviously pick up on some of the key points uh, being highlighted around the challenges that producers de um, direct are facing. So we have uh, today uh, three uh, fantastically experienced panelists working with smallholder farmers. Uh, firstly, Lisa Schrader, Director, Director of Mercy Corps AgriFin Accelerator Program. So um, Mercy Corps through their AgriFin uh, Accelerator Program have already reached 10 million farmers um, across a range of their programs and have mobilized a rapid response uh, to supporting smallholder farmers with COVID-19. Um, and we're very appreciative of Mercy Corps Agri Finn, um, who have funded uh, the consortium work uh, that we're going to share with you today. Uh, Lisa has over 20 years of global experience focusing on digital financial inclusion and supporting smallholders to access agricultural finance. And uh, secondly, John Steele, CEO of Cafe Direct. Uh, John has led Cafe Direct as a CEO for the last eight years, 
We're turning um, Cafe Direct to growth and profitability, while also maintaining and upholding its uh, commitments to producers and of course to uh, producers direct through Cafe Direct's uh, business model and uh, gold standard. And thirdly, Sylvia Nengo, Head of Programs for Producers Direct. Sylvia, a co-founder of Producers Direct, I'm very pleased and proud to introduce her. Sylvia and I have uh, worked together to found and lead Cafe Direct uh, for the last 10 years. And Sylvia has pioneered a number of farmer-led innovations that Producers Direct has developed and scaled it over the past decade, including our work, work to pilot and spin off WeFarm and also in youth-led innovation. So just to, to remind everyone, um, we'll be um, allowing time at the end of the panelists' presentations to uh, respond to Q&A. So if you do have questions for any of our three panelists, please uh, put them in the Q&A uh, section in the panel below. Um, and so with no further ado, um, so firstly, uh, we're going to go across to Lisa. So Lisa, as Director of Mercy Corps AgriFin, You've been leading Mercy Corps' response to COVID-19 across multiple countries and multiple partners. So could you share with us, please, a bit about the key activities that you've been undertaking and, so far, the learnings that have emerged from this work? Thank you so much, Claire, and, and thanks for inviting us to, um, uh, to participate in this webinar today in this discussion with this great group. Um, uh, I have been uh, based out of out of Kenya for the last five and a half years leading Mercy Corps AgriFin programs. Um, these are funded jointly by uh, the MasterCard Foundation and the, the Gates Foundation to work with organizations of all types uh, to leverage technology to reach farmers. Um, our hypothesis at Mer Mercy Corps AgriFin is that you know, technology can go a long way to helping us build engagement models and deliver services to smallholder farmers, but that um, it's going to take a lot of innovation and uh, a lot of trial and error. Um, and the, the, the goal of Mercy Corps AgriFin programs is really to kind of stand side by side with organizations um, that are taking on that challenge. Uh, we have more than 150 partners across Africa and all kinds of value chains in across Kenya, Tanzania, uh, Zambia, Ethiopia, and Nigeria, um, and are really um, thrilled to be working with Cafe Direct and, and, and We Farm on this, this COVID response. I have a presentation, Claire. I don't know if you want me to just go ahead and go, jump into it. Yes, please. That would be fantastic, right. Lisa. Thank you. Okay, go. Can everyone see the screen? Can you see the screen? Yes, I think um, okay. everyone should be able to see your screen. Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. All right, then let me go ahead and 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 get into this. Um, so at the at the onset of of COVID nineteen, we were already beginning to respond at at Mercy Corps Agrofin to hundreds of our partners and and millions of farmers that were being hit by the desert locust. Uh, the desert locust challenge uh, across Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, Somalia. Um, but then, of course, as, as, as all, I think we all know exactly where we were when we realized that, that COVID-19 was, was going to become such a gigantic threat to the globe. Um, I think that, that what has been really interesting for us is to understand how extremely important digital channels are uh, in this time of COVID-19. Um, you know, we mobilized very quickly uh, with some of our funders, uh, you know, to get work started. Um, but we realized that, that as trucks closed down and cities closed down and roads closed down and farms closed down, the cell phone was one of the few things that was still really open for smallholder farmers. Um, and all of our partners were desperate to talk to them, desperate to reach them, desperate to support them. Um, and so our COVID-19 response started a couple of months ago and we've already reached more than 7 million farmers with critical content. Um, I think that uh, the partnership with uh, Producers Direct and, and We Farm has been the most central in really understanding farmers' needs. Um, you know, everybody is trying to scramble around to figure out what, what's necessary. Um, but uh, what, we've, what we've done um, with Producers Direct and, and, and We Farm and many other partners is to understand farmer needs and begin to develop content. There is a lot of content out there. Um, much of it is not relevant to rural areas and not relevant to smallholder farmers, does not speak their language, does not, um, you know, reach them in terms of, of the understanding. Um, we realized through this research that there was a lot 
there were a lot of myths and a lot of fear uh, in farmers. It hit in Africa uh, halfway through the aggregation cycle and a lot of food was, was lost as farmers shut down their gates and, and, and you know, really tried to figure out how to respond to this. So a big part of what we're, we've been doing um, over the last couple of months is working to help farmers understand the threat and how to respond. Um, we've also uh, been using technology like WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp uh, sites to help farmers monitor and report um, different kinds of issues, whether that's you know desert locust landing um, in their in their county or um, whether they're worried that they're sick, um, that uh, whether they, uh, you know, whether they they don't know whether a marketplace is open or not um, nearby. Um, and what we're really starting to do now is move into the phase of building products and services for longer term recovery, um, especially ahead of the, the next agricultural cycle, which is starting in East Africa now as farmers decide what to plant, how to plant, how to get resources, how to find a buyer. Um, so I think one, one of the big surprises for us has been um, how many channels have been necessary to reach farmers. Uh, we use television and radio, but we're also using SMS, particularly with partners like WeFarm, to reach millions of farmers, uh, finding that Facebook groups are very, very active, WhatsApp groups, uh, chat bots, and face-to-face -face training, uh, also using voice recognition um, centers and, and basic, basic tools like call centers. Um, you know, we're just finding that it's a massive mix of channels that are necessary to really reach farmers and to hear back from farmers. Uh, but the mobile phone is really at the center of that. Um, we're also very fortunate one of our funders has given us um, some funding to, to um, do research at this time on channels and behavior change. Um, you know, so what's most effective to reach farmers, what kind of messages really transform behavior, um, and what's next in terms of recovery. So very quickly, these are some of the most recent statistics from work that we've done uh, with our partners, understanding farmers and, and, and more general research as we work with organizations like the World Economic Forum. Um, so right now, the UN says that one in nine people are suffering from hunger. So this has been exacerbated, obviously, by the pandemic very quickly and people living at the margins like smallholders are heavily impacted. Um, we know that the pandemic is affecting every level of agricultural supply chains, uh, including transportation, inputs, financing, offtake, and, you know, and farmer decision making at the core. Um, we know there are a lot of persistent myths with farmers uh, who believe that uh, COVID can spread from their household pets to their livestock. Um, and we know that higher food prices are hitting them. Um, we know that 87% of farmers say that their financial situation has, um, has deteriorated during the pandemic. Um, sources of, of non-farm, off-farm revenue like remittances that farmers often rely on just to smooth things out um, are diminished. 70% um, of farmers in Kenya and Uganda are having difficulty finding markets, transport, and 90% of farmers polled last week have hired less labor. Um, so this is this is an environment where we believe a food security crisis may be um, may be in the making um, over the next six months. Um, we wanted to show you really quickly uh, the the way the channels work. Um, you know, we work to develop content with players. Um, you know, like IDO.org, listening to farmers, developing content, and then to deliver them to large numbers of farmers across channels. Um, and like I said, uh, we're, we're doing research and, and really trying to make these channels as interactive as we can, because farmer situations are changing week by week as they, as they uh, evaluate the crisis. So this is a, this is a, um, just a quick snapshot of one of the social media posts. As I said, we're using WhatsApp, using Facebook and other types of tools. And you know, you can see that, that things myth busting like livestock can't get or spread COVID, you know, really encouraging um, farmers to use helplines and, 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 and really seek medical attention if they're sick. And then just other kinds of, of myths about extreme heat or bleach really being the answer. Um, but I think, you know, I think that right now, after this first phase of pandemic response, um, health messages are getting out there. And we believe that the next phase of messaging really has to support 
more active links for farmers to financial services, inputs, transportation, labor, and markets. Um, so we're really looking forward to continuing our work um, with uh, producers direct and with um, with we farm and the rest of our partners um, you know to uh, overcome COVID um, and uh, and really to try to help our farmers sliding um, back into poverty when they've worked so hard to get out of it and also to help um, buyers uh, input providers and all kinds of partners um, to reach farmers um, in a successful way um, and to keep markets moving I think that's that's the end of my of my slide um, Claire, just uh, I hope I'm on time. <laughs> oh, that's, that's perfect, Lisa. Thank you so much. It's it's fantastic, and um, Messi Kaur Hagbifin has such a wide overview and insights from such a diverse range of partners. I think it's a shining example of how an um, impact can be leveraged when you bring together so many uh, consortium partners. And essentially, that's um, that's what we're looking to do uh, through this webinar and and all follow up. So thank you so much. Um, so um, without further ado, I'm going to go across now to look at a different aspect of the supply chain um, and introduce John, um, John, CEO of Cafe Direct, who I'm sure many um, of you know. Um, so, so John, um, question for you, uh, looking at the challenges that COVID is presenting through the supply chain lens, uh, what, do you, um, what are the challenges that Cafe Direct are seeing in terms of uh, the supply chain issues that you're seeing um, through the lens of the producer partners? Uh, but also some of the challenges that Cafe Direct is seeing more broadly for its supply chain. Thank you, John. Thank you, Claire. And um, <clears throat> I'm still refl reflecting on Lisa's in incredible words and insight. And uh, you know, pre-COVID, um, many of these communities were very vulnerable. And to think about some of the impact is is quite um, it's, it's, it is unparalleled on on rural communities. Um, before I just give people a feel of what we're experiencing on the ground now, um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a reminder and background to Cafe Direct because um, 30 years ago, well, nearly 30 years ago, Cafe Direct wasn't really set up as a business. It was it was set up as a, a direct response to a crisis. So uh, Cafe Direct was born from uh, producers and uh, charities coming together to uh, get rid of the injustice that um, occurred when the coffee price agreement fell apart in 1989. So I think that that has really helped us to um, be more of a response to crisis and more of a collaborator than a, than a business set up for kind of business purposes. And I think that's that's helped us hold smallholder farmers and their livelihoods at the heart of our business ever, ever since. And um, I think that's why we're really energized and excited to be part of this initiative, because if you, you listen to the co collaborative efforts of Mercy Corps and you see the kind of work the producers direct is, is doing, and just the title of today's webinar, and clearly putting farmers at the center and uh, enabling farmers to lead the response is the best way of having a, a, a meaningful and enduring solution and I, I feel quite passionately that it's it's not about a cafe direct response or a fair trade response or any other actor it's about us all coming together to face into a crisis that is clearly going to have un, unparalleled um, negative effects unless we come together and build on the the momentum and the work that Lisa and the rest of the team have set out and um, yeah producers direct is quite astonishing really because it's a very small team across a number of continents um, who really do put producers at the heart of everything they do and, and the way they do everything. So I just wanted to get across that kind of feeling of, of how, how this collaboration can work. In terms of what we're seeing um, as, a, as, a, as a business, I think the first thing is I've been quite astonished at um, Parallels with everyday work that you get in in your in the in the in the markets in which you're operating. So, firstly, I think um, as a business, forecasting has been uh, incredibly difficult. You know, we're seeing huge swings in demand. Um, some of those are incredibly negative swings. Some of those are are positive swings, and you're trying to work out the permanency of those changes. And I think 
sharing that um, those movements and, and and forecasts with producers, which is what we've been doing with Producers Direct and with our um, procurement team, I think is is quite helpful because you know, the uncertainty that's breeding fear needs to be if you can remove some of the uncertainty, which is about how you're seeing your your volumes and sharing that. I think that's very helpful. So we certainly try to do all we can to share you know where we see our our sales performance going and share that directly with our producers so that they get a, a feel for demand from us as a, as a buyer effectively so that, that's the first thing i think the other thing is and i think you've you touched on it in your um talk lisa is is just communicating frequently and openly and um producers direct has enabled us to have uh, you know zoom calls with a number of producers in a number of different parts of the world and I think um, just uh, not only letting people hear, hear what's going on uh, on farm but I think also letting producers know where we are because the uncertainty means people are worried about you know markets across the world and the, the impact of this um, unprecedented crisis on, on um, you know the UK for example as well as uh, in, in Kenya or um the other thing that we we've tried to do is try to um procure more coffee to try and give more security of of, of supply so certainly we have increased our our stock holding and our, our forward ordering so not only giving visibility on what we want to procure but also trying to procure more and more and use up our any any working capital to so I think we've increased our coffee supply by about 50%, which is ahead of our needs, but we know we're gonna need that at some point. Um, the other thing that um, you know, is, is, is clear is, you know, we, we see in our lives significant changes in um, the way we're having to uh, run our businesses and, and live our lives. And I think those are consistent but amplified at origin. So, you know, just moving coffee around and um, buying and selling is incredibly more complicated than it ever was before. And uh, as you saw in the video, and you'll see as the video continues, all those added protocols that we're feeling in our own lives are, are having to happen in, in, in places that are much, much less able to contain and deal with them. Um, I think also, you know, there's a real the danger to health and, and livelihoods is also will impact on on harvesting. And I think mid midterm there's a real danger that um, this will impact on um, the ability to get coffee um, out, out of origin in the case of coffee. Um, so I think we're seeing we're seeing. Um, yeah, you know, some impact, but we're trying to manage that by being open and and transparent and close to our producers. And um, you know, I think um, we'll, we'll continue to try to uh, communicate frequently and in as much depth as we can, but also make sure we're using some of the technology that Lisa touched on to have really open dialogue to help us see where we all are on this on this journey. Um, I think ultimately, you know, we're here because I think this is a really special moment for all the actors to come together and support a farmer-led response. So I think rather than individual organisations of whatever nature they are trying to do the, the best they can, I think by coming together and backing farmers, the response can be much, much greater and much clearer and, and also really make a bigger difference. So I think... Uh, you know, we're, we're genuinely excited just to be part of um, everybody coming together in this way and it's quite astonishing the number of people on this call and number of great organizations so you know thank you all for spending your time uh, in, in, the, in these difficult times I think that's that's the wrap from me thank you so much John uh, that's um, fantastic insights from the cafe direct perspective um, you mentioned uh, the video and um, I think the irony hasn't escaped us that uh, the reason we tried to do a video uh, was to actually 
uh, be able to uh, showcase the farmer voice without worrying about technology and connection failure. And actually, uh, we've achieved the opposite. So that's unfortunate. But as, as always, when working um, in, in different contexts, um, resilience and adaptability is, is key. So uh, we're going to try and run the video again. Uh, please bear with us. Um, we appreciate it. It might, um, it might stall again, but it's, uh, it's really important, we feel, to get the farmer perspectives into this discussion. Um, and so we're going to go back to the video now, and then uh, we'll go on uh, to Sylvia from there. Uh, before we uh, start to try the video again, um, just to um, invite everyone, um, we'll be going after the presentations to Q&As with the panelists. So if you do have a question, uh, please put it in the question answer box at the bottom of the uh, Zoom call. So uh, thank you very much and um, back to the video for one more try. Bueno, ya para todos la situación es, es, es diferente este año, ¿no? Es un reto más que tenemos todos como organización, como, como personas en realidad. Uh, with COVID-19, we are in a situation where this disease has affected farming uh, negatively, and we, we are here to, do, to have some mitigation measures where farmers should be protected from all this disease. Because this disease is real, we are sure that when we, this information is passed to the farmers, the farmers will be safe and will be working on their farms. La cooperativa describió los protocolos necesarios para evitar el contagio a sus socios y entre colaboradores. Primero, nosotros hicimos los lavaderos para que todas las personas que ingresaran se laven las manos. También la medida de la temperatura para ver si todos están bien y no con fiebre. Luego, establecer el distanciamiento social cuando hagan sus actividades los socios y también los colaboradores. Suspension of all public gatherings, closure of offices, closure of uh, 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 businesses, uh, uh, then uh, all the schools were closed, universities suspended, so all public transport was suspended. So all these uh, are affecting the day-to-day -day life. Nosotros hemos tomado decisión de ir vendiendo de acuerdo cómo vaya el mercado, de acuerdo cómo estamos haciendo la evaluación en campo, porque también se va a haber pérdida de cosecha en campo. La escasez de mano de obra puede conllevar al tema de pérdida de cosecha, ¿no? Entonces estamos viendo la forma de cómo se pueden ayudar en el tema de mingas, en el tema también de que permitan el libre tránsito en la, entre el mismo distrito, que no hay casos acreditados, claro, por un documento entre ellos. Y bueno, eh, estamos, estamos bien en general, ¿no? Since the farmers are mostly at home, they are able to produce more, but since there is no uh, place to sell their produce, they are not able to earn their income, and therefore they get a lot of losses at their farm. Nos afectó mucho eh, en el tema emocional, ¿no? porque eh, estar acostumbrados a la libertad, luego a no poder salir, porque muchos teníamos actividades como el tema de fertilización, de aplicaciones, y no podíamos eh, comprar los productos, los insumos para hacer estas, estas aplicaciones y fertilización. So we have uh, reduced the number of workers. So we have few workers who can't accomplish uh, the work that should be done in a specific time. Yeah, but it can't be completed in the in limited time because we have limited workers in the attempt to ensure the social distancing requirement. Then we have to buy the the protective gears, the PPEs, you know, like the face masks, you know, like the sanitizers, like all that kind of of, of arrangement also is not easy for, for for the organization. Son desafíos grandes 
y en ese desafío se ha resaltado la confianza. El agricultor para mandar su café a la cooperativa. La confianza, un valor muy importante que a través de los años se ha podido construir entre el socio y la dirigencia y los colaboradores acá en la empresa. farmer uh, would advocate that this information should, should be said, uh, given to the farmer, all farmers around and be sensitized and get to know about the protective measures. The materials are very, very effective. So they are able to see and learn without so much of exp explanations. Uh, with this information and the, and the policies and the measures that have been put in place, we are really hoping that uh, our farmers and our communities will be able to adhere to and be able to protect ourselves from further um, infections of COVID-19. Siendo los centros de excelencia un modelo muy importante que se ha venido trabajando con Produce Direct, COVID-19 nos enseña de que ese modelo tenemos que replicarlo. Después de, esta, de este trabajo del COVID, viene la capacitación a nuestros socios, una capacitación constante para desarrollar nuestra economía social y ambientalmente responsable. Muchas gracias. So much i'm really delighted it worked that time um so going back to our panelists i'm really pleased to um give the floor to uh sylvia um sylvia as i mentioned is head of programs for producers direct and um has been uh, with producers direct almost since day one for 10 years now so uh sylvia uh, having led our work with producers direct to tackle COVID 19 but also the broader work with producer partners I really invite you to share um, a bit more about the challenges that we're seeing from our producer partners on the ground in terms of the impacts of COVID 
uh, but particularly uh, the actions that we've been taking as a consortium to really tackle these impacts. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it is definitely a big honor to speak today. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya, and I'm grateful to everyone in attendance and for also for making the time. We are now very much aware that producers and small scale farmers are in a context that none had planned ahead for because of COVID-19. Our farmer cooperatives had not imagined a time in a very recent future where the agricultural extension services team could not visit their farmers to provide in-person support on good agricultural practices. And as you've seen in the video and also heard from Lisa earlier and also from John, Producers Direct, with the support of Masiko Agrifin, uncovered through a farmer-led online research process, great insights into the impact of COVID-19 on smallholder farmers and what they are really most worried about. For, for instance, um, most farmers have a general understanding of COVID, but don't understand the personal implications on themselves and their farms. There is a belief that this might not be, uh, they might not be vulnerable to the disease in the same way as others, um, other people or the, the rest of the population. There's also an attempt for farmers to continue doing business as usual, and uh, therefore farmers are exposing themselves to several touch points and putting themselves uh, at a lot of risk. For example, going to market, using public transportation and actually hand handling cash or doing cash transactions. There's also a lot of myths or misinformation and farmers uh, are looking for or don't have or you know, may not be having access to sources of truth. And farmers are therefore navigating conflicting directives and adopting bad practices. For example, using bleach to wash farm inputs. Another thing is profitability. As we know with any enterprise, it's a major driver. And farmers are very proud of their role in society, but they are primarily motivated by the need to make money and feed their families. Producers Direct, therefore, took these insights and we have had as an opportunity, we've, we, we had uh, to design information packs to smallholder farmers on COVID-19 with an aim to enable the farmers to adapt and build their resilience in these challenging times while continuing with their farming activities in the community. We put together information packs focusing on four main farming related areas. One area is farming smart, which is messaging that focuses on practices farmers can implement on their farms. For example, washing farm tools with soap and water before or after sharing. A second area we, we looked at was keeping the community safe with messaging that focuses on behaviors farmers should adopt or change when leaving the farm, interacting with others in the community, as well as handling cash transactions. The third area was now looking at these myths that were uh, being shared. And this messaging focused on busting these common misconceptions around COVID and staying healthy. For example, how, how actually is COVID-19 transmitted? And can, for each example, infect livestock. That was one of the myths that were, was going around. The fourth one is the area around activating new behavior, which the, this messaging focused on new behaviors and attitude that farmers should have around, uh, around adopting or working in the context of COVID. This COVID-19 information pack is now available to farmers in various different media, as you've seen. We have posters that we've posted at agrovets, at our partner offices, at town centers, at farm aggregation points or buying centers. We have uh, social media posts that have gone out on Facebook, WhatsApp. We are using SMS. We have radio ads. We also have this full set of materials on the Producers Direct website. If anyone is interested, you're welcome to, to log on to our website and you can access that full set of materials and we can share out to, to your to to your network as well. We have to date reached a million farmers in East Africa and Latin America with this information packs on health and safety. And we've received a lot of positive feedback from farmers on the usefulness of the information. But this is just a small component of the potential scale of work that Producers Direct has been doing for the past 10 years in addressing small scale farmer challenges. 
So Producers Direct has over these 10 years been improving or working to improve farmer livelihoods through improving their productivity, income, and enhancing farmer resilience. Producers Direct strategy not only looks at the health effects of COVID-19 outbreak, but also on food security of smallholder farmers and the sustainability of the global food supply chain, because 70% of food produced worldwide is from small scale farmers. Something that we have noted during this pandemic is we have seen a decrease in food production, and Lisa mentioned this in her presentation, with farmers spending only that 5% of their time doing farming. And this is a result of the social distancing and the stay at home protocol. And this, we see there's going to be a long-term effect in nutrition or availability of nutritious food for farmers and other consumers. Secondly, we are seeing there's an increase in food wastage because of restricted movements. This means that farmers cannot leave their farm or are not able to leave their farm in order to go and sell their product at the market. And another thing that we've also seen is there are instances of conflict or percentage loss in income as farmers are harvesting and selling up to 70% less than, the, than you know, previous years. So what is Producers Direct doing to respond to these challenges? One thing that we're doing is we're looking at increasing small-scale farmer access to digital training and information beyond COVID-19 health and safety information to more safe and nutritious food production practices. We have previously been providing farmer face-to-face -face trainings and now we are digitizing our farmer content and training materials to use media such as SMS, WhatsApp, radio, and also partner platforms like Farmer Inc. to train farmers online on farming enterprises like beekeeping, kitchen gardening, avocado, banana production. And so far with our model that was in person or that is in person, uh, has uh, trained over 100,000 farmers with this model. With Digi with a digital training model, we are set to significantly amplify our farmer-led training proposition. Secondly, our strategy is for further investment to tackle food security challenges presented by COVID-19 through implementing a digital cooperative model to tackle food waste, income loss, and youth unemployment. We are very delighted to announce our recent partnership with World Food Program Innovation Accelerator to pilot this digital cooperative model, and we hope to scale it to our whole network of a million farmers. This digital cooperative model looks at activating a youth leader network to provide market linkage opportunities across East Africa and Latin America. Our work with youth in farming communities began over five years ago with the aim of investing in a network of inspiring youth leaders and young agripreneurs who, by showcasing their innovations and enterprises can reframe the perception held by most young people worldwide that agriculture is a dead end job with no opportunity. We have invested in this network of youth leaders and supported them to deliver services to smallholder farmers. For example, they provide transport and logistic services and they also sell farm produce. This youth leader network is particularly critical now in this COVID context in responding to COVID because Aging farmers are vulnerable. We need to support youth job creation at a time where employment opportunities will become increasingly uncertain and also addressing the significant challenge of aging farmers being nervous about leaving their farms to transport products. So through this digital cooperative model, the youth leaders have managed to support the farmers increase their income by 50% through these market linkages. And there's also the opportunity for the young people to find employment and earn some income. Finally, we are looking into scaling our farmer-led data system to improve farm decision-making and risk management. We shall be blending cutting-edge technology and data systems with farmers' knowledge and expertise, while supporting farmers to more effectively use data to manage their farms Productive, productively and profitably. While it's generating data insights directly from farmers that support businesses that are working with farmers to enhance supply chain transparency and capacity to manage risks. 
I would like to end by saying it is important that we become intentional in coordinating support services to farmers and to also coordinate investment in responding to this global health crisis. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. I'd like to hand over to Claire. Thank you so much, Sylvia. That was uh, fantastic and um, really inspiring. Um, so just to check, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. So I was just getting a few technical challenges then. So um, this is a chance uh, for um, everyone here to um, pose their questions to the panelists. So uh, just to remind everyone, um, this is specific, specifically questions um, on the panelists' presentations. Uh, we'll have some time after this to open up to um, a more general um, conversation where I think we'll, we'll go into definitely a deeper range of, of different issues and, and topics. Um, so um, as Sarah is reminding everyone on the chat, uh, please definitely um, use the Q&A function to share any questions you have. So um, going first, um, just to give Sylvia a chance to catch breath, going first to uh, Lisa and then John, uh, one, one question that's come up. So we've been talking a lot about communications in terms of um, reaching smallholders, but what are the other support services that farmers are really asking for right now? Um, could you share some examples of some of the key uh, things that people need to be thinking about investing in, as well as just information? Um, so um, if it's okay, Lisa, I'll go to you first on that one, and then um, John to follow up from there. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, as we're, we're moving into uh, the next agricultural cycle, usually here in Kenya and in the regions, you know, you've got two, um, if you're lucky, three. Um, and so, you know, one thing that we're finding is, is that a lot of farmers are, um, hang on, I'll turn on video, a lot of farmers are um, wondering where they can get inputs. Um, they've been uh, going, uh, you know, to some input providers um, that, that are not stocked. Um, it wastes a trip. Um, it's they consider it very risky to go. So I think they're looking for you know clear information on on where they can get inputs. But but even before that, I think that one of the things we're hearing from from farmers is that they're trying to decide what to grow um, in the coming season. Uh, markets are definitely disrupted, especially export markets. Um, and a lot of farmers um, had a lot of post harvest loss uh, at the end of last season um, when COVID hit because they weren't able to find markets. So, you know, we're finding farmers saying, should I grow maize? Should I grow potatoes? Should I grow, you know, should I take mangoes to market? You know, what, what should I be investing in now? So they're, they're trying to figure out, you know, how best to invest um, in the right value chains. Um, and then we're hearing definitely um, that they are very worried about labor. Um, how do they manage labor? Where do they find it? How do they, what standards um, should they set, you know, so that they can deal with, uh, you know, truck drivers coming? How can they keep things safe? Um, we are also getting uh, a lot of requests for farmers wanting to find out more about post-harvest loss solutions. So how can they get uh, storage bags? How can they get silos? How can they get anything that would allow them to um, mitigate post-harvest loss? Um, they're on the farm um, and wait for a better market or um, protect food so that they can um, consume themselves. Um, so, you know, I think they're always trying to make that decision between what to grow for consumption and what to grow for cash. Um, and I think they've all really resigned themselves to the fact that no bank is going to make them loans. Um, but I think that uh, what we understand from talking to banks here in Kenya and in other countries where loan guarantee, loan first loss facilities are in place is that, you know, maybe the banks would be willing to support um, input providers to keep stock there. But they're all asking themselves that question, which markets are going to um, are going to move. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and then John, just to follow up on that, I mean, would, would that be a similar kind of perspective from your side in terms of access to finance um, for the, the producer partners that Cafe Direct sourcing from? Because obviously um, you're, you're looking at it from a quite strongly Latin American perspective as well. Yeah, no, I think um, yeah, the, the points that Lisa make are the, are the right ones. I think, um, you know, I was trying to think about whether there were there were things further than the economic position, but you know, the, the immediate um, requirements we're getting really is about knowing that you're going to be buying, and knowing that you're going to be getting the financing across fast. And I, I think, in a way, I, 
I think I think it's 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 best for us all to be very honest with producers. I think if we're seeing that we're not going to be buying, that's as important as, as saying we are going to be buying because you know with with uncertainty, it's very difficult to plan for. And so I think in the first instance, you know, being very transparent about purchasing, and then I think building on Lisa's point, wherever we can be purchasing more and making sure that the financing is flowing faster. You know, th this is this is primarily at this stage about cash, and 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 kind of clarity on what you're what you're facing into economically is the main kind of message we're getting. Um, so I think um, you know, um, making sure that you're paying a good price. I think there's concern that people will try to be opportunistic and pay lower prices, and I think you know, e even the fair trade minimum is, you know. <laughs> A relatively low price. I can see a question coming through on the on the chat about about living income and um, from Wolfgang, which is, you know, there's a there's a fundamental need, and there was pre-COVID to shift more value and pay a sustainable price um, for food in, in general terms, and certainly in the commodities we're dealing with. Um, and so, you know, although in the short term for us in this crisis, it's about the financing and the the clarity on 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 buying and trying to hold more stock ourselves and move more across. I think you know, some really th th this kind of crisis makes it very clear some of the the macro points. If we don't solve, you know, the the, the, the Im impact of a li living income, anybody will come back and really be a, a significant problem, let alone all the ethical issues it raises. And um, you know, I think the living income work that started in Coco last year with, with fair trade, I think that's a start, but we need to all build on that faster. And I think, um, as you know, Claire, we're also looking at how else you can add value at origin, not just you know, to, to enable farmers to have more of the value as well, per se. But um, no, I think in, in, in the short term, I think the the, info, the, the video you, you guys have shared and the incredible um, information that helps people to manage their lives and the uncertainty in, in the immediate term needs to be followed up by this kind of economic um, support, whether that's in kind of more financing or certainly in trying to um, per purchase more uh, or at least be honest if we're not able to be doing that. So hopefully that builds on the point. Thanks, John. Um, and then just uh, Sylvia, going across to you, um, thinking a little bit about picking up on both the question on support services, but also um, living incomes for, for farmers, and also thinking about the opportunities to uh, diversify incomes to avoid dependency on, on just the, the main coffee or the tea crop. Um, just to give you a floor, the floor to respond on any of those points. I know you touched on it a bit in your presentation, so uh, just just to build on that a little bit. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Um, just to also say that that the situation, the way of working at cooperatives has has essentially had to change with additional operation costs being added to tea and coffee companies to support uh, to be able to manage in this context. But also, what that has meant is we are now seeing the value in terms of the investment that has been that has been put in tea or cash crops essentially to organize and to be able to manage crises or whatever challenges or whatever stresses that come onto that supply chain. But when you look at the, the small scale farmer, um, you, we are looking at, an, uh, at a situation where they need to have diversified portfolios or sources of income and have that same level of resilience and that same level of support um, within that supply chain. And Producers Direct has been building that um, diversified uh, farmer uh, portfolio. So we've been supporting farmers not only to rely on tea and coffee incomes, but also build other supply chains and farm them, um, farm, uh, do farming as, um, as a business. So we are supporting farmers to do beekeeping as an enterprise, kitchen gardening as an enterprise, and also uh, banana and also other, other farming enterprises. But supporting or providing information in this aspect needs to translate to income and these some of these services are now much more critical to invest more more um, more in in terms of providing market access linkages and using digital tools or digital um, aggregation 
um, service you working with agents to be able to uh, uh, provide um, that uh, service where we're able to see what farmers have um, and then what markets are available and being able to those without having to be in person or to, to aggregate that, that, that uh, process in person. Something else I've also noticed is we need to be able to contextualize these COVID-19 measures because, for example, what does social distancing mean in a, in a farm? Does it mean that uh, during harvesting, the way that farmers have been doing harvesting needs to change? And that affects the volume of harvest being done per day. And that may translate to more um, you know, cost to the farmer. And what does that do to the farmer's income? So by the farmer being able to organize themselves, organize their farm, and be able to see their costs in a, in a, in a more um, a deliberate way, the farmers are able to take decisions on how to, to cope with the, with the current context. Back to you, Claire. Thank you so much, Sylvia. So um, question uh, here from Ewan, which I'm going to uh, pass to Lisa. So Lisa, this one's for you. Uh, so um, the point about cash flow at producer organizations as well as individual farmer households being currently very challenging. Um, do you have any um, examples of innovative approaches uh, that organizations or farmers themselves are taking to deal with this currently within the COVID context? Yeah, um, we are, I, I think one thing that's been really interesting is that if you inject capital, if you inject cash just at the agro-dealer level, that doesn't necessarily mean that the farmers have the money to go and get the inputs. Um, and if you finance the, the aggregators, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the farmers produced what the, agri, you know, what the buyers are going to need. So um, I think that what we've seen is that you kind of have to have an integrated approach uh, to, the, to financing, to injecting liquidity across the value chain. Um, one thing that, um, sorry, I keep turning off my video because internet in Kenya is not great. Um, uh, one thing that we've seen is that a lot of the commercial banks uh, here in Kenya have been over the last couple of months and in other countries where we work, um, they, they have uh, different organizations that have put in first loss uh, facilities, uh, different kinds of guarantees. Um, but what they're telling us is that they absolutely, so they're ready to deploy money in, um, but they absolutely have to have a digital trail to track it. So one of the things that they're, they're looking at doing are, are putting in lines of credit into input providers and different kinds of aggregators, off takers, uh, transportation providers, <coughs> excuse me, but they want to be able to see a digital trail in real time about how much money they're spending or not spending. So, you know, we do have um, different kinds of players along value chains that can provide that kind of real time information. <coughs> you know, excuse me, sorry, 100 um, farmers bought these inputs today, 200 bought them tomorrow and drip feed um, liquidity into these environments to manage risk. Um, the other thing that we've looked at, which I think is maybe really important, um, None of the banks want to um, give money directly to farmers. There's just so much risk right now. Um, but we have talked to several organizations that are looking at unconditional cash transfers to affected populations. Um, they were originally very interested in, you know, of course, urban, uh, urban people who've lost their jobs and dealing with COVID, but we're starting to see more and more among um, cash transfer companies like, uh, or organizations like Give Directly, that they'd be willing if they had verified farmers um, they'd be willing to basically send them a small injection, even $25, $50 um, per farmer that would just be cash and mobile money um, that would allow them to do whatever they need to do, if they need to pay labor, if they need to buy seeds, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I think this is something um, that we should be, as a community, raising a voice that cash transfers and injections in the farmer level now, um, you know, over the next six months will make a difference. Uh, but at the same time we have to make sure that the banks there's so much liquidity sitting in those commercial banks um, and and what we're finding is they just don't they're not quite sure exactly how to plug in um, so I think a lot of conversations with banks are needed we're, we're talking right now to seven commercial banks um, that are looking for uh, opportunities to engage and um, and so I think that we kind of have to help um, walk them into a, a very uh, chaotic environment and at the same time really try to get tangible support to the farmers directly. I'm sure that there are other ideas. I'd love to hear from the rest of the panel. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, 
So I think um, I'm going to take one more question in the uh, Q&As from the panellists and then um, we're going to go on to the broader group discussion. So everyone who's not a panellist, please, please be ready. Um, so uh, the, last, the last question for the panellists, just um, I'm going to direct this one to Sylvia. So uh, this one's about youth in agriculture. Um, and what um, do we think in terms of uh, the advancement of this trend post COVID? Um, assuming at the moment, um, youth might be re-engaging uh, in farming more uh, because of the challenge with um, employment opportunities and the loss of employment in informal sectors as a result of COVID. So, you know, do, do you see this being um, a short-term trend or do you see opportunities to really invest to transform youth leadership in agriculture moving forward? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. I, 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 I'll just take the point, the last point you actually raised. It's, it's around that transformation. Uh, there is a transformation in agriculture that is ongoing and has been ongoing for, for some years now, around now. I think youth taking, um, you know, a look at agriculture as a, as a, as a, as a, as a job opportunity rather than uh, the last opportunity. We are, you know, we have uh, seen ad, uh, advocates of uh, uh, of agriculture, um, um, of agripreneurship, of um, you know, uh, young people making a living from agriculture, and I think it is actually a trend that should continue and will continue because of the aging um, the the aging farmer population, and that that shift is required to continue because that gap will continue. Um, you know, needs to be filled. And, you know, in, in the current era that we are in of peak youth, we are in a situation where we have more youth in the world than ever before. And therefore, youth will, will even if um, post-COVID, there will still be more youth that would, need, would be needed to be in agriculture as well as other professions. And I feel that we are with, um, with a turn in technology and with, a, with, with, um, with exciting opportunities and innovations and more investment in agriculture, young people are being more considerate of, of, um, of agriculture as a, as a profession. You're on mute, Claire. Oh, sorry. Um, so thank you so much, Sylvia. So, and um, just wanted to say thank you very much to all of the panelists for all of your insights uh, so far. Uh, so we're going to uh, move on and broaden out the uh, discussion a bit more now. So um, hopefully all of the great questions and ideas that have been coming up on the chat so far, please uh, feel free to um, continue them. So essentially, um, what we're going to be doing uh, now is we're going to be moving on to um, the group discussion. And so um, the group discussion is uh, framed around uh, three key questions, essentially. Um, and hopefully these questions should be familiar to you. Um, they're the ones that uh, we shared uh, with the event right in right ahead of this. Uh, so um, hopefully everyone has already been thinking about those and uh, storing up all your good ideas and, and recommendations. So uh, questions for everyone to consider. Uh, so the first one, very much building on what uh, we've been talking about so far, what are the short and long-term challenges that we're seeing facing uh, producers across uh, the world? And consequently, because of that, uh, global food supply chains. What are the effective initiatives that are already underway to support smallholders that we should look to scale up? Essentially, what we want to be doing is really building momentum with this consortium. We're definitely not looking to work in silos. We really want to have this be an opportunity to share ideas and see how we can effectively work together and mobilize resources. And then building on from that, thirdly, uh, what do we think we can do actually better as a consortium of partners, recognizing we all have, uh, we all have links to different smallholders all over the world. You know, we're all working to develop innovative solutions to support smallholders and supply chains. What could we do better together? Uh, so those, those are the three questions that um, I'd like everyone to consider. Um, so just in terms of um, the way that this is going to work, just to explain that. So um, a bit different now, um, we're not uh, necessarily using the Q&A function. We're going to um, switch and use the raise your hand button. Um, so if you would like to comment or share an idea, uh, please raise your hand. So you should be able to uh, see that essentially on the, on the Q&A slide that's showing now. It shows you how to do this. So 
on the participants list next to your name, you should be able to see um, a raise your hand uh, icon. So please click that. Um, and then uh, what we'll do is we'll try, and I say try because uh, we haven't tried this with so many participants, uh, to bring around a virtual mic. Um, but just, just to recognize, we've got an amazing number of people on the call. It's, it's fantastic. We may not be able to necessarily get to everyone. So uh, just, just letting you know, but we'll try and cover as many different ideas and perspectives as possible. So hopefully on the line, um, if the connection is working okay, um, somebody that we had um, hopefully set up to uh, respond as our lead respondent. So uh, just checking uh, Lebby, um, Lebby from RSTGA um, in Tanzania. Uh, do we have Lebby on the line currently or is technology going to, to fail us again? Um, just checking. No? Okay, we'll, we'll try and find Lebby. So Lebby is the chair of Producers Direct. Um, he's based in Tanzania and um, he's, he's one of our smallholder uh, producer leaders. Um, so um, with that, um, I can see that Hannah, Hannah from Rainforest Alliance um, has got her hand up. So um, Hannah, we're going to uh, go to you as our first, first lead respondent. Um, hopefully you should be able to um, unmute your mic. Um, let us know if you have any tech challenges, but Hannah, please, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Claire. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Great. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you to all of the panellists. That was uh, fantastic. Really, really interesting and, and very thorough. So, I mean, not a huge amount, amount more to add. You've, you've given us some, um, some great examples. I think on your first question around the, the short and long-term challenges and and certainly immediate consequences of, of COVID on, on producers and smallholders. I mean, you've, you've covered very well the, the key points, obviously notwithstanding the, um, the potential health complications, of course, and then the fragility of, of livelihoods and producers' economic resilience. Um, I think there's a, love, a, a lot of other kind of knock-on effects as well, which, which are being felt in the short term too. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, obviously disruptions to local and global markets um, and to jobs and the ability for families to earn alternative sources of income. Um, for example, due to travel restrictions, um, these are making these even more acute. But then also, I think um, there's, there's, you know, some key knock on effects. For example, there's been discussions of, of risks. We know child labour is obviously a um, uh, in many instances, a, a, a massive consequence of, of poverty and, and economic challenges for smallholder communities. So there are shorter term as well knock on effects for, for issues as, such as child labour and also the protection of, of environments and, and forests as well. Of course, um, we know this is a huge risk for that. Um, so, yeah, so and I think you've, you've covered really nicely the need for um, producers of course to, to diversify to survive um, where one or, one or more crop simply isn't going to be bringing enough uh, in enough um, finance to feed their families um, so yeah I think I think there's just going to be as I mentioned a lot of other kind of short and medium term knock-on um, um, in terms of other effective initiatives so at Rainforest Alliance like many partners on the call um, and mentioned in, in the presentations, lots of our kind of initial mobilisation was around our country offices and, and via our field staff to communicate with partners and producer organisations, recognising that the challenge that they face are very specific to, you know, to the, obviously to their geography and to their, to their crop. Um, so yeah we then we also we mobilized quite quickly to provide some emergency funds um and then some emergency grants to producer organizations um that are very much led and, and based on the challenges that that they're specifically facing as as a kind of short-term stopgap um making sure as well that we can continue to provide technical support and remote trainings um as you guys have done as well making sure we're, we're making best use of the digital tools that we've been you know, testing and piloting over over the, the last few months and, and years. Um, yeah, so for example, in Ghana, we've also been using radio messages and, and broadcasts and kind of public announcement systems, both to translate um, and transmit messages around COVID, but also, um, you know, usual kind of agricultural trainings and, and those sorts of messages, market information that would usually be done face to face. Um, 
so yeah and i won't i won't tackle your last question yet because i'm sure there'll be some some good contributions from others on that in terms of what we could do better as as a consortium thanks so much hannah that's fantastic and i think as you say um particularly on the digital training tools um it feels like there's a really strong opportunity for collaboration there rather than everyone uh doing everything separately so which we're also very aware of with producers direct as well i'm sure we're guilty of that um so I think then um, I see that uh, Thomas uh, from WeFarm has raised his hand. Obviously, WeFarm has been a really uh, leading partner in the consortium so far. So delighted that, that Thomas would like to, to like to share. And um, Thomas, uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thanks, Claire. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Awesome. Yeah. So. Excuse me. In terms of the questions, uh, the first one of uh, the challenges, short and long term, I think uh, the first one, as the uh, speakers who have mentioned earlier, was around the communication piece because we had lots of, uh, you know, information that was not reliable spreading across different channels, and the root of this problem for the producers or the farmers was uh, the fact that they do not have access to you know websites of uh, credible institutions like the ministries of health or the world health organization and also the coverage of media in terms of televisions on which uh, many ministries were passing information the coverage is not uh, really that much so in order to curb this, in terms of the initiatives that came up, uh, with them in collaboration with other partners here, came up with the COVID messaging, which was really, really helpful for the farmers to explain to them the bits around COVID, what they should look out for in terms of the symptoms, what they should do when they notice these, and to where they should report, which I think was really great. Uh, still around the challenges on the input side, uh, there has been limited access to inputs at the start of the pandemic, which was basically as a result of the halt on uh, public transport, which is used by the producers or the farmers to access retailers, and also the closure or, you know, loss of jobs, just like the earlier speakers mentioned. So this affected the purchasing power of different uh, you know, producers and farmers. So in order to curb this, uh, WeFarm came up with, uh, with an initiative of Boda Boda Delivery. Boda Boda is basically a motorcycle. So it was delivery of inputs to the farmers to, pre to bridge that gap. But as the lockdown, which was initially imposed, is being lifted, public transport has resumed. But the challenge is farmers do not still uh, have easy accessibility to the retailers. So still we farm is working with brands of agricultural inputs to bring to farmers different um, inputs across the different categories like seeds, pesticides, fertilizers, and capital inputs at discounted prices such that they can increase their production and then the third bit is around uh, the reduced extension services. Traditionally in countries here, especially in the East Africa, uh, extension services are face-to-face, -face, but due to the pandemic, the challenge that came up was that those face-to-face uh, -face interactions could not happen anymore, which gave rise to adoption of uh, digital services and on WeFarm, we've seen an increase in the, on the, num in the number of ma uh, monthly active contributors who are basically users who use our Q&A platform on which farmers share information about farming, which is really helping out a lot. Crossing over to the output side, I think the biggest challenge uh, comes here and question three, which is what could we do better together as a consortium? I think this is an area where I think we need to collaborate a lot because I see that uh, due to the pandemic, we had many farmers face challenges with the market, especially those who deal in livestock, 
like poultry and dairy farming because uh, the biggest market for them are schools, hotels, and the tourists who usually come into the countries. But due to the ban on, you know, uh, traveling by the closure of airports, the closure of schools, closure of hotels, these products have not had markets. And then the other bit is we used to have um, weekly open markets whereby farmers could bring their produce and sell openly. But due to the ban on public gatherings, these are no longer possible, which is a big challenge. So I think this is an area where we need to come together to see how we can solve the problem of output from the farmers. Thank you, Claire. Thanks so much, Thomas. That's really fantastic. And I think we farms always such a, a great example of innovating quickly, like with the Boda Boda. So obviously I'm biased, but uh, you know, nonetheless. Um, so I think now um, I can see quite a few people have raised their hands. Thanks so much. So um, we'll go across um, to, to Paul. Um, so, sorry, one thing I forgot to say. So um, when everyone um, unmutes, if they could just say their name and um, the organization they're representing before their intervention, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Uh, so my name's Paul Rook. I uh, represent the British Coffee Association. Um, so, so obviously from the, from the consumption end and, and, and Capri Direct being, being one of our members. Um, and I'd, I'd like to sort of follow what Hannah said, I think, you know, the, the three presenters have done a, an excellent job and, and I'm probably going to sound a little bit like a broken record because I'm, I'm going to repeat a lot of what has already been said. But I, I maybe bring a slightly different perspective, having been in the coffee industry only for a matter of three or four months, um, but having spent quite a number of years in the, in the, the agriculture sort of sector. Um, and I think a number of the, the issues, you know, such as uh, some of the, certainly the short term issues, I think have been fairly well covered. Um, the issue of labor availability um, and, and flexibility and, and mobility of, of that labor, I think have been, have been very well highlighted and, and a significant problem. I, I guess the one thing I'd pick up from a consumption end is, uh, and I think John's picked it up with the, uh, the point he made about about Cafe Direct having taken in uh, a lot more coffee uh, stock than, than than would normally be the case uh, to to try and, and sort of mitigate some of the challenges that people are facing, uh, and I think we've we've seen that on a on a wider uh, situation, particularly around some of the speciality areas where you know the, the, the shutdown in the in the coffee shop uh, environment in the UK, but in a number of other countries as well. I think the, the ability of the trade or the willingness of the trade to sort of pick up some of those stocks and, and be able to take them into the system to try and keep the, um, the, the, the process moving. Um, I think looking slightly longer term and probably picking up on question two as well, some of the initiatives. Coming in from the, from the outside, I've, I've, I've been on a number of webinars and heard some fantastic work that's going on in the in the coffee industry and you know not least some of the the, the sort of the work that sylvia has been talking about today when you, you know you see some of the examples and you think yeah that's exactly the the sort of thing that you know that that, that people need to be seeing and that producers will, will be wanting to sort of hook up to particularly some of the of sort of the digital technologies that that um both both her and lisa have, have talked about but I do have a slight concern about how um, tied together some of those initiatives are. And I think it's already been picked up a little bit about how uh, the, probably we, we need to see a little bit more, more coordination in, in to, to, to get the, the best out of, uh, of you know, this excellent work that's going on. And I think, again, the, the one element that I'm, would be interested in coming into the sector and, and trying to understand a little bit more is, is how do we communicate some of those initiatives back to the consumer? How do we ensure that the consumer understands that, that actually looking sort of longer term, you know, we need those producers to survive because we need them to continue to produce the coffee that, you know, that we all love, that, that we, we go out and, and, and drink every day. Um, and I wonder how the sort of the digital 
world, uh, the, the innovation that's, that's underway in a number of other sectors can actually help us to, to better communicate some of that um, in, in the way that a consumer will take up, but communicate it a little bit more sort of effectively. And, and how we use technology such as blockchain, I think is something that, that I know is already being talked about in the industry, but how do we, how do we sort of bring that together a little bit more? So, so greater collaboration, I think, is the one key thing that I'm sort of picking up um, as, as a relative new boy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. I think that's fantastic. And I think, yes, it's, it's definitely spot on in terms of a lot of innovation, a lot of investment in digital solutions, but uh, definitely a lot more scope to, um, to kind of collaborate on those, particularly from a producer perspective as well, and not necessarily designing multiple solutions with producers um, and, and not coordinating on those. Um, so I'm going to uh, go now to uh, Ewan, who I see has his hand raised, and then uh, panelists, um, after that, if there's anything uh, that you want to pick up on in terms of points raised so far, um, I'll, I'll give space to do that, and then we'll go back to um, the broader group. So um, Ewan, the floor is yours. Uh, just to check you in that that you're there and can hear okay um you might you might be muted mm, okay so that should be me now sorry yeah, okay got you perfect i almost <laughs> moved on so just got one time. thank you i i just introduced myself briefly i'm, I'm ewan reed i'm managing director of matthew algae a coffee roaster based in scotland and we provide coffee principally to the hospitality industry throughout the, the UK and Ireland. Um, I, I think, first of all, we, we mainly work with smallholder producer groups. Uh, Fair Trade Coffee makes up about 85% of all of our purchases. Um, and, and indeed, smallholder production would account for uh, close to 98% of all the coffee that we source. Um, so we've been made very aware in our dialogue with, with producers um, as to what the challenge is, and, and it's really been mirrored today in, in what's come through from, from the panelists and contributors today, um, you know, around uh, food security as being a real concern and, and perhaps an emerging crisis uh, that we will see. And also some of the economic factors, I mean, John has spoken to it around cash flow as being really key, and, you know, we're seeing that at, and just to reflect on what Paul said on on every element within the value chain currently, whether it be with our customers, uh, whether it be with that we're providing extended terms to at the minute, whether it be uh, consumers themselves here in the UK, um, and that rippling through, unfortunately, to those that are perhaps most at risk from cash flow issues uh, further in the other direction, the supply chain, the producers that we source from. Um, so it's very difficult, I think, for ourselves, we're seeing, a, because we're so, uh, sourcing for the hospitality sector, we're seeing a reduction in volumes in our marketplace quite significant at the minute. Um, we haven't been in a position at Cafe Direct to be able to do to increase our buying. What we have been able to do is to maintain our buying. Um, so we've uh, committed to all the contracts that we've made and to our normal buying patterns. Um, and uh, I've try to ensure that we keep cash flow moving through the systems as well. And really looking at similar ways, uh, I'd almost coming on to question two now, um, how, where we've got programs and projects running is making sure we're continuing to see liquidity in those, be flexible around repurposing in terms of uh, those programs adapting to, uh, to change requirements from a COVID standpoint. And really that's, that's something that we're seeing uh, throughout the entire value chain at the minute is being able to move quickly, you know, be able to seize on opportunities or be able to adapt to mitigations really quickly. And that dissemination of information is, is really, really important. And also I think, and again, it was a point that John made is just being really open. Um, if you can't buy coffee or there is a problem supplying coffee, is uh, being really open with other actors in the supply chain around that. And that's maybe my customers or that may be the producers that we work with. Um, I think looking at question three here, then for me, it's been really inspiring today to hear 
the work of the consortia and the synergies that are coming together and how that's delivering and also has reacted very, very quickly here to, um, and, you know, I, I, I would applaud the work and I, I'm really, I feel privileged today that getting the opportunity to understand this uh, being shared today is it's absolutely fantastic work and uh, something that I hope we could align to more as an organization ourselves in the future. So thank you. Thank you so much, Gian. I really, really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, it's fantastic to have your, your perspective on it. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go across now to uh, Lebby again. Uh, hopefully uh, Lebby is, is on the line now and um, can hear us okay. Um, Lebby is based in Wungwe, um in a town very many miles from Dar in, in Tanzania. So um, connection is sometimes a challenge. So Lebby, just, just checking um, over to you if you can hear us. Welcome. Thank you very much, Claire. Can you hear me now? Can hear you loud and clear, Lebby. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Claire, and all the panelists. Uh, Sylvia, John Steele, and uh, uh, we have Lisa. Uh, as you have introduced me, I'm working with a, a cooperative called Rungwe Small. Uh, I mean, it's Rungwe and the Musokelo T Cooperative Joint Enterprise that is based in the Rungwe district in the southern part of Tanzania. And uh, we are uh, a cooperative of about 15,000 farmers working in tea and the other crops, but their main uh, line of business is tea. And uh, during this time, we have been uh, facing a lot of challenges, especially during uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We have, first of all, I can say here in Tanzania, we have a very unique situation compared to other countries. That since the pandemic started up to now, the country generally didn't declare uh, a total lockdown. Therefore, everyone, we are continuing with the work. Uh, it was on you as an individual or organization to be able to take measures or control, to make sure that at least you are safe from the pandemic. Uh, therefore, it was a very difficult situation. Public transport were there, uh, offices were open, uh, farmers were continuing with the farming activities, training were continuing, but as an organization, you were supposed now to take care of everything by yourself. Therefore, it was really, uh, really uh, challenging situation. Uh, we, we had some of the uh, crops or products that are uh, being sold in the international market being affected during the uh, pandemic, especially avocado. Uh, farmers here in Lungwe have failed to sell avocado this year. Only uh, big producers with the estates that have been able to sell some of the uh, avocado, but with small the farmers, it's only local market. We failed to reach the international market because of the pandemic. Uh, some of the public gathering were uh, really seriously affected. Uh, therefore, really uh, working in this pandemic, it has been a very big challenge to us as an organization, also as farmers or producers. Now, the initiatives underway to try to work in this situation, we've been using our radio station. We were, the good thing is our cooperative owned the radio station called Chai FM. Uh, and we have been using our radio station to broadcast training uh, programs, uh, other uh, awareness creation of the pandemic, but um, really our radio has been very helpful during this time. Uh, we also have an extension unit. Currently we have 17 extension officers uh, located in each uh, agricultural marketing cooperative Society, and uh, they've been helping a lot. Uh, regardless that we didn't have meetings, at least they were able to visit individual farmer, taking care of themselves, putting on mouth, 
a mask and trying to use sanitizer and they're keeping a distance of one meter, but it was one to one. It was really expensive to do that, but at least it was helping. We had some few farmers, uh, at least with the reasonable literate level, we have been using handout. Therefore, we split uh, some of the topics into different handouts. And some they've been reading the handouts, and after they finish, they ask questions to extension officers, and they receive the second uh, package of handouts. At least we have been able to uh, train, especially things related to uh, rainforest alliance standards uh, and fair trade standards. The use of handouts has helped a lot on that. Uh, something that we see it can be strengthened in future perhaps also the, the use of radio station can be strengthened um, with the, the context we have right here in Rungwe, the use of radio station will be of much help that's the short uh, experience i can share now thank you very much Lizzie. Thanks so much, Labby. Um, fantastic. And the connection actually turned out to be really clear. So, so that's wonderful. And I think um, also a really good lead um, into inviting Eleanor from the Fair Trade Foundation to uh, take the mic. She'd also mentioned uh, the support from both uh, Fair Trade and Rainforest certifications there. So, um, Eleanor, thank you for being so patient. Um, we shall uh, give the last um, word uh, to you uh, before going back to the panelists for um, finally final closing remarks and, and wrap up. So, Eleanor, over to you. Thanks, Claire. I um, have to say something good now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we have seen obviously um, the COVID crisis has really exposed the fragility of global supply chains, and I think that consumers have been made much more aware of that and that's been a really interesting to see and it's potentially will have long-lasting effects on what consumers want to see in terms of certification on their products and promises of sustainability which is could hopefully be a benefit of this situation what we see now is that investing in resilient supply chain which has been mentioned by all of the panelists and lots of the people in this discussion is so important and really promising to hear a lot of chat about kind of diversification of incomes, um, which is really vital for, to allow producers to become more resilient to these global shocks, pandemics, and also as we look to uh, fighting the climate breakdown and um, how that's impacting coffee producers really significantly. Um, so really great to hear that. Uh, also, I know that Lisa mentioned earlier about um, the develop um, the setback that this will cause to development efforts and the um, potential hunger that some of our producers might be facing because of these um, because of the lockdown and um, the impacts of the pandemic in various countries and their abilities to um, raise an income and keep working throughout. Um, what we uh, have done as fair traders we have set up a um, very two different um, initiatives basically to support our producers. So we initially have created a fund um, to uh, uh, give out grants to um, yeah grants to producers to be able to use these to support their producers, um, and they've used these in their communities in various different ways, which has been really amazing to see. We've also allowed more flexibility around premiums, so all producers in coffee and tea will be getting a fair trade premium that their community will decide how they use. What we've done is we've allowed more flexibility in this um, in terms of reporting about how they're using that. So they can now be used for emergency cash payments to ensure that farmers get their usual wages or um, those that are using them for aff affording food and things like that to make sure that they're able to feed their families, which is really important. I also just wanted to touch on our kind of general thoughts on how companies and um, those in the industry can be supporting smallholders to tackle COVID. And we've just got a couple of things that we think are really important. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion about 
financed and that predictable and reliable financing and we totally agree um, it's really invaluable for producers to know what's going on um, and we as fair trade have been reporting back on things like the market in the uk and how we think that might impact them but to hear that cafe direct and others are are doing the same thing for their producers is is really fantastic and i'd encourage others to do that as well um, and also the um, things like immediate business protection, so supporting suppliers in taking emergency measures such as PPE, salary protection, emergency finance, to get past that first kind of crunch that we saw at the very beginning. Um, partners that were doing that, that was really fabulous. And then as we move on to kind of building back better and what can we do to support producers in the future, the uh, role of advocacy in this group I think is really important and making sure that through potentially this consortium, what can be done to make sure that um, both the UK government and, and wider are able to support producers as we potentially go back to normal, but do we want to create a better and a new normal um, and how can we uh, amplify the voices of producers within that? Thank you so much, Eleanor. Yeah, I think um, we've been working closely with the Fair Trade Foundation to support uh, producers to access the um, the funding that you've been making available. So that's that's definitely been a massive, massive bonus. Thank you. Fabulous. <laughs> Um, so um, thank you so much everyone, it's been a really rich discussion and, and hopefully uh, just the start point actually, um, we've covered so many issues definitely. Um, before we uh, wrap up this part, I'm just going to um, pass across to uh, the panellists for any um, closing remarks or um, responses on, on points that have been raised um, from everyone that's, that's, that's shared so far. Uh, so Lisa, um, maybe going uh, to you first. Or Connection. Yeah, I, I think um, thank you so much for for involving us, and and I was, um, you know, really interested to hear the story from Rungwe T uh, in in Tanzania. Um, I I know that the that the radio channels and other channels that Rungwe has built over the years are the most trusted channels for the Tanzanian farmers that they serve. Um, so I think that the ability for producer organizations on the ground, um, you know, reaching farmers to change behavior and, and really support them through this time is just can't be overstated. Um, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of news flying or information flying around, but there's such a great trust relationship. So I, I think that's such an important um, strength to be leveraged by this, this whole consortium and it's exciting to hear about. Thank you so much. Um, John, any uh, closing thoughts from your side? Thank you, Claire. Uh, closing remarks, uh, sounds so serious. I think um, I, it's, been, it's been quite an amazing call. I think um, you know, it's, it's a diverse group, but it's clearly, um, in these kind of circumstances, I think you see people's values come to the, to the fore, and I think you you realize that we all feel the same way about things. So I think that's really, really promising. I'm listening to, to you and, and, and others on the call. Um, and clearly, you know, keeping, being farmer led in the response is a way of uh, probably making it the best response possible. I think my other two thoughts, um, it's made me really feel that uh, we need to focus on cash. Uh, and financing, uh, because you know it's also a question of priority. Um, and I guess, I guess, finally, you know, these calls are great, but it's all about what we do next and the actions we take. So I think we, we all need to reflect on that. And certainly, that's it's, this has inspired me and, and made me want to do more and be more focused on what we do. So no, thank you for a really uh, interesting discussion. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia, um, any final thoughts or reflections from, from your side? Thank you, Claire. Mine is to say thank you to everyone. and Thank you for the rich discussions and the sharing that we've done. And to call us to continue, you know, keeping a strong front in the face of all the challenges that we are facing. Uh, because it is through, you know, pro, um, give, giving each other strength that we are able to build our resilience and overcome a lot of the challenges that we are facing and none of us can do this alone. So we need each other to be able to come together, unite and 
with the different strengths that we have, we will be able to overcome most of the challenges that we have. Thank you very much. And I look forward to connecting with anyone um, and everyone. Please reach out and I'm sure we'll, we'll be sharing contacts after this call. Thank you. You're on mute, Claire. <laughs> Sorry, I keep getting overexcited. So, so thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, so once again, just to say thank you to panelists, uh, Lisa, John and Sylvia um, for, for leading on the discussion. Uh, but also um, thank you so much to all of our producer partners who um, the majority of them are unable to connect on this Zoom call, but invested so much time in helping us make the video, um, which as you hopefully will agree um, was a really impactful insight into the challenges that they're seeing at the moment. So I think uh, we wanted to close uh, by just uh, wrapping up, uh, sharing a few reflections on possible next steps and um, sort of really uh, being clear on, on where hopefully uh, this consortium uh, can go from here on in. So I think one of the really important things that, you know, we've talked about this a lot and, and John makes a really strong point, um, you know, what, how do we move this uh, discussion on uh, so that it's not just talk, but actually action around collaboration. So, you know, as we were saying right through this conversation, our goal is to grow um, the consortium of partners that we're working with to mitigate the impacts of COVID on supply chains. There's nothing that we're doing that has any kind of intellectual property protection or anything um, on it. You know, our, our goal is to really uh, maximize uh, the impact and the reach of all of the great work that's going on and really try to use um, this, the crisis that COVID presents as an opportunity also to, to drive change, but also uh, drive uh, better ways of collaborating, which perhaps I think we can all agree we're not always so good at. So I think, I think that's really key. Uh, so what we wanted to do actually was just then uh, finish with another poll to check in on how people are feeling about um, you know, what they've heard on the call, but also um, what would be um, interesting in terms of continuing the conversation. Um, I've been promised that we're going to share the outcomes of this, uh, whether or not people uh, decide that they actually want to be part of something or, or whether um, people are still undecided. So we're going to be completely transparent, whatever the, the outcome. So I'll leave you uh, just to respond and, and reflect on that for a few moments. So I think while, um, while the poll's running, I also just wanted to share a little bit um, our initial ideas on what a framework like, might look like. And we've deliberately kept this quite loose. Um, you know, as we will have um, kind of all be feeling, there's so many issues um, that have been addressed today and it feels like we're just scratching the surface. But, you know, essentially uh, what we're trying to do is think about how we um, frame the consortium and our work together about insights, action and impact. Uh, firstly, uh, thinking about sharing the insights that we all have across different aspects of um, smallholder challenges and the supply chains um, and the ultimately then the sustainability for all of the businesses internationally who are working with smallholder farmers. Thinking about how the consortium can more effectively act together, both in terms of uh, disseminating information that we already have but also jointly investing in some of the farmer-led support services and financing that we've been talking about today. And ultimately, um, as a consortium, uh, we're targeting to reach uh, 5 million farmers over the next um, uh, 12 months uh, through uh, this collaboration. So we would really invite you to think about the smallholders that you're working um, with, either with your organization or through your supply chains, and what role uh, you might all be able to play in ultimately helping us to take this, this forward. Um, so I'm going back to the poll, um, just uh, having a look and seeing um, what, how people are feeling. I think there's, um, there's a lot of interest in getting more information. That's definitely a good result. Um, there's a few people who are, who are still undecided and uh, we're determined that we're going to convince you. So for sure, we'll be uh, following up uh, with all of you. Um, and I think also, you know, there seems to be um, a, a strong interest in uh, thinking about how we can join together and advance this discussion. So, um, you know, really appreciate um, and thank you all for, for your contributions on that. In terms of uh, next steps, uh, the way that we um, are going to uh, advance um, the discussion and uh, the actions. So I think 
uh, we'd really like to follow up with you um, as much as possible one-on-one, -on -one. Um, you know, so to have those individual conversations, learn a bit more about what you would be interested in, and also explore uh, further collaboration. If there's interest in holding another uh, webinar session like this, um, hopefully you need to give us a bit of time to reduce our stress levels from managing this one, but we can definitely uh, convene another webinar to have a more concrete discussion on actions and, and what we can do together. But ultimately, uh, you can expect the, um, the following three things from us. So we'll be sharing uh, all of the uh, materials uh, from the webinar today. Uh, so that will include the PowerPoint presentations and a download link to the video. Uh, we'll be uh, reaching out to um, all of you who are interested to um, see if a more detailed conversation would be, would be of interest. And then uh, for everyone who's agreed for us to um, kind of follow up on the event bright listing, we'll be in touch to let you know and share uh, discussion points from the webinar and, and next steps. So uh, definitely um, the start rather than, um, you know, the kind of the end point. So we really hope um, you'll join us in this. Uh, just to say thank you so much to everyone again for supporting us just by uh, participating and contributing so much today. Uh, we really appreciate it. I think it's so exciting uh, when there's so much energy and momentum for supporting uh, this work with smallholders. And I think um, for us, we just really look forward to collaborating with you all to deliver impact together. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you for everyone who organized the, 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 the webinar and uh, behind the scenes tech support. And um, yeah, wish everyone a good day wherever you're based. Thank you.